Hey everybody, it's Will here. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode of the Blackware Intelligence YouTube channel. Today we're going to be continuing with our on-chain analysis tutorial series, talking about exchange balances and how to follow exchange flows. But before we get into it, just a little housekeeping as always, would really appreciate it if you could hit the like subscribe button. Uh, let me know any feedback on this video as well as other metrics that you'd like to see covered moving forward. Um, and I, one other thing before we get started, this week we're having Charles Edwards on the podcast, who's the founder um, of Capriol Investments, as well as the creator of Hash Ribbons and Supply Delta, which is an on-chain metric. Um, so let me know any questions that you have for Charles, and I'm looking forward to interviewing him this week. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. So exchange flows and uh, generally exchange balances are just a... Uh, Kind of schematic that a lot of people have been following over the last call it year or two really got a lot of popularity at the end of 2020 um, and since then there's been a lot of people that say you know exchange balances aren't useful to follow and so today we'll just kind of dive into uh, looking at how exchange flows work how they can be useful how they cannot be useful and some like kind of nuance that you need to keep in mind when monitoring them so first of all, why monitor exchange flows? So to start, exchange flows are based on data heuristics done by on-chain data providers that track major crypto exchanges wallets to the best of their abilities. So you know, there's there's uh, no perfect data provider in this. It's all kind of a, a estimated guess, right? It's all just kind of a an educated guess. I mean, um, you know, all these all these data providers are using their kind of in-house proprietary heuristics to track these wallets to the best of their abilities. And these wallets are constantly changing, which makes this quite difficult, uh, especially on a shorter term timeframe when you're, when you're watching these things. This data may differ a bit from, from data provider to data provider. So, you know, a glass node may have different information than coin metrics or crypto plot. Um, and so, you know, just keep that in mind. And, you know, ideally what you wanna do is look for confluence across several exchange, I'm sorry, I'm sorry across several data providers. So, you know, if you're seeing a very large outflow from coin metrics, then maybe you check crypto quant and glass node to see if you're seeing that as well in those data heuristics. If you see, you know, all three heuristics picking up the same across multiple data providers, then the probability of that uh, being accurate is probably much higher versus if you're seeing a big outflow on glass node, but a large inflow on coin metrics and somewhere in the middle on crypto quant. You probably want to wait a bit for those kind of heuristics to kind of settle out. Um, and kind of going off of that, uh, again, I kind of touched on this, but you really don't want to be using this on kind of an intraday time frame. These heuristics are subject to change, especially in the, the day to three days after uh, the data is, is inputted onto the, onto the website. So especially with, with Glassnode, for example, they recommend waiting at least a week before feeling confident in what the exchange data is showing. Um, part of that is just because, you know, the, the wallets are getting shuffled around constantly um, inter exchange. Uh, and so, you know, it constantly makes it difficult for the heuristics to track these wallets. They have to update them every day. Um, and sometimes you, you kind of get these flows that slip through the cracks and maybe an inaccurate representation of what's kind of going on. Exchange flows can be useful in determining market behavior, including accumulation and distribution. Um, I said including because, you know, obviously this is kind of the main uh, trend that people look to follow is, are you seeing inflows or outflows to and from exchanges to kind of determine are people buying or selling? Um, but you can also use exchange flows to determine if people are sending their BTC to exchange uh, to exchanges, first of all, for collateral on, uh, you know, on derivatives, for example. Are they sending BTC to lever up on, on finance or something, right? Um, as well as people just getting yield on their BTC. For example, you can get 8% uh, yield on FTX. So not to, not to shill FTX, but it's just the first product that uh, came to mind. So, you know, it's not always accumulation or distribution behavior, but generally that's what people watch exchange flows for. So understanding exchange heuristics, so kind of off of what we just talked about, um, these heuristics are very difficult to track. Uh, they best kind of age like fine wine. And so this chart just shows you uh, an example of, of this kind of, uh, this idea that I just described is just that you're looking at the number of addresses uh, with a balance of over uh, zero BTC and then just zero flat you know, BTC balances um, on exchange, on exchange uh, entities. And so what you see is that, you know, after 2018, you saw a really large influx of number of addresses with zero BTC. 
Uh, and so basically it's just showing you that, you know, constantly these, these uh, wallets are being shuffled around, uh, exchanges are using, di using different addresses. And so these heuristics have to constantly track them uh, as, you know, these exchanges are using new addresses uh, compared to the ones that they had previous, you know, previously marked um, as a certain exchange. All right, now we're going to look at exchange balances, uh, basically the historical uh, trend of, of all exchange balances over Bitcoin's history. So as you can see, uh, coins really didn't start coming onto centralized exchanges into kind of 2014. Uh, prior to this, you know, we had Mt. Gox um, into 2013, but before that, people just traded Bitcoin peer to peer. In 2014, you started to see kind of the mainstream kickoff of a lot of the exchanges that we know today. Uh, in 2016, early uh, 20, or sorry, late 2016, uh, exchange balances hit 1 million uh, BTC, and from there we started to see some some interesting behavior. Uh, after that, you started to see people pulling their coins off exchanges, which kind of initiated a quote unquote supply shock uh, that preluded to the 2017 bull run. Throughout 2017, you continued to see more coins come onto exchanges though. I think this is a good illustration of the fact that a lot of the participants in, in 2017 were retail. Uh, and so retail keeps their coins on exchanges because they're either nervous about taking custody, they don't understand how to do so, or they're just in Bitcoin for the short term to flip Bitcoin over, you know, I'll call it several week or month time horizon. They're not looking to, you know, uh, put their Bitcoin in cold storage and, and take custody of their BTC for the long haul. Now you'll see exchange balances continue to trend up all the way up to above uh, 3 million up until March of 2020, and this is really interesting because a uh, little fun fact, uh, exchange balances peaked out on the day of the COVID crash. So we saw an influx of coins onto exchanges on uh, March 12th during that 50% that down move for BTC, along with the risk off in all markets uh, as correlations went to one amongst the kind of COVID panic. During that, we saw the peak of um, all-time exchange balances across the board. And after that, we entered what I call, quote unquote, new paradigm of institutionalization. Uh, nice little buzzwords there for you. But essentially what I'm trying to say is that after that time period, I think because of the uh, new type of market participant we had, given the macro backdrop of uh, extreme quantitative easing, you now had a type of participant in the market that wanted to take custody of their BTC. They were more worried about the risk of um, of counterparty risk. So they wanted to take custody of their BTC, albeit through themselves with their own private keys or through some type of custody provider, for example, Fidelity. Uh, and so what we saw is from March of 2020 all the way up until kind of April to March of uh, 2021, we saw a just perpetual decline in exchange balances, a brief little uptick on that, that uh, kind of plateau move in, in September 2020 before continuing to decline again. Uh, but in, in general, just a perpetual decline from, from March to March, from 2020 to 2021. Uh, during March 2021, we saw an influx of coins coming back onto exchanges. Uh, ideally, that was either for collateral to be posted as well as people moving coins onto exchanges to be sold. Uh, I remember making a Twitter post before the, uh, before the March 12th, I'm sorry, the May 12th uh, dump uh, when we moved down to 30K. I remember seeing the largest day of inflows to Binance ever. So that was a, that was a pretty uh, spooky day. We saw massive inflows um, to several exchanges, but in, in particular, I remember seeing Binance had the largest day of inflows ever. And with that, we started to see a reversal in the trend for about a month or so, saw coins coming back onto exchanges up until the end of the summer. And with the end of the summer coming, um, as Bitcoin started to move off those lows, we started to see coins coming back off of exchanges. This continued until kind of late 2021, um, into the kind of October, November timeframe, you did start to see coins coming back onto exchanges. Uh, and since then, from a kind of flat with a bit of a downwards drift, but no real aggressive trend um, since call it late summer of, of 2021. Next, we're looking at exchange net position change. So this is basically looking at the same thing. You're looking at exchange balances, but instead you're looking at the 30-day change. And so what do I mean by that? I simply mean you take, uh, what's today? The 22nd. So you take the, the balance of exchanges on today is February 22nd, compare that to January 22nd. Subtract the difference in the balances and that's where we get exchange net 
position change. Um, and so where this can kind of be useful is to track broader trends. So when we start to see, you know, some type of behavior in the actual just exchange balance, that's, that's interesting, right? But when we start to see this translate to a persistent uh, behavior on the 30-day trend, that's showing that you have this kind of broader behavior going on. Uh, and so that's signaling to you that, you know, there's this like macro, if you will, trend of, of accumulation or distribution behavior uh, in the market at the time. Next, we're looking at exchange net transfer volume. Um, so very similar, but instead we're just looking at every day, the amount of coins coming into exchanges versus coming out of exchanges. Some notable events are you know, prior to uh, March, 2020 before the, for the COVID dump. So a massive influx of coins into exchanges, as you can see. Uh, and then after that, after we kind of had bottomed out there, you saw a massive outflow of coins out of exchanges. Um, we saw an inflow on that move up in September of 2020 before that 20, 25% correction before the main bull run kind of kicked off. So that's another you know, substantial uh, inflow there. And then as well, the one I had talked about uh, prior to the prior to the May dump, we saw a massive influx of coins on exchanges. This was particularly concerning. Um, and then at the end of, uh, of at the end of summer of last year as well, we saw a huge outflow of coins from exchanges, even larger than uh, after the, the March, the, the COVID dump, we saw a massive outflow of, of coins from exchanges. Uh, very similar during the September correction. Uh, and since then, haven't you know seen any crazy outliers, but uh, as you can see, we did get a bit of inflows kind of at the top in November and inflows uh, before this moved down as well. So, you know, the, before we move on to this, you know, I just kind of want to state that you want to look for confluence across all these things. Uh, you know, they're all basically showing you the same thing at the end of the day, but you can look at the three of them in confluence to kind of see what's the broader trend going on, right? Um, and that can kind of give you some, some better insight, some, some more nuanced insight into kind of what's the, what's the trend going on. Here we're looking at uh, exchange fee dominance. It's just showing you the amount of uh, exchange fees relative to overall transfer volume. Uh, so I think this is useful for two things. First of all, it can just show you that, you know, there's a decrease or increase in speculation either way, as we can see in 2017, just a massive increase in exchange fee dominance up to about 45% of overall volume uh, and as well. And, and right before the, the dump in, in May of last year, uh, we saw that get up to about 35%. Uh, I do think that this is probably where we've peaked out in terms of exchange fee dominance. The reason is because exchanges now batch their transactions. So they batch the transactions together so they don't have to spend as much on exchange fees. Uh, this is something that's uh, become popular. I know for a fact on Coinbase, not 100% sure on other exchanges, but I know that's kind of a broader trend that exchanges are looking to implement. And so with that, I do suspect that you probably won't reach these levels, but I do think the trend is interesting to kind of show you the amount of speculation in the market. And you've just seen this perpetual decline from May. Um, and this is in confluence with a lot of other on-chain activity, which I'll make a, a video on on-chain activity, but we saw a lot of these things peak out in April, May. And if you're going off of on-chain activity as kind of your bull or bear market threshold, then it does seem like we've been in a bear since kind of April, May of, of 2021. With that being said, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up. I know this was a, a quicker video than some of the others. Uh, exchange flows are based on data heuristics done by on-chain data providers that track major crypto exchanges wallets to the best of their abilities. These flows can indicate both accumulation and distribution, as well as other behaviors to or from exchanges, including people moving coins onto exchanges for yield, uh, and also collateral being posted for derivatives, including futures contracts. This information is best used to identify broader trends. And on kind of a side note uh, off of that, just remember that price is set by the marginal buyer or seller. Um, so the reason I say this is the following, you can have 20,000 coins moved off exchanges, which, you know, in practical terms, that means that those coins had to be bought, which likely had translated to price action. But keep in mind that you can have a large outflow of exchanges, uh, but if they're bought in a certain way, maybe they're all bought OTC that has minimal price impact. Um, you know, the price is set by the marginal buyer or seller. So you can, you know, you can have a massive outflow of, of coins from exchanges over, so call it a, a month long period. Uh, but on some low liquidity night, if the order books are really thin, you have a bunch of open interest aggressively positioned to one side, it may only take several thousand coins um, to significantly trigger some kind of cascading effect, some kind of liquidation cascading effect. Uh, a good example of that would be um, up here. Uh, 
I think this was at the end of end of December. We had that move down on like a Friday night, all the way down to like 42 K. Uh, that was pretty much uh, like 8,000 BTC from Binance that had kind of triggered that from my understanding. Uh, you had a large, you know, buildup of open interest position to the long side, uh, as well as, you know, again, there was low liquidity in the order books. So it was just kind of set up for this right move to the downside. Um, and so, yeah, just remember like price is set by the marginal uh, buyer or seller in the immediate term, but these metrics can be used to kind of help you identify the, the broader trend. And again, you do want to look for confluence with other supply related metrics to get what's kind of the broader uh, trend of, of supply dynamics from an on-chain perspective. With that being said, I hope you guys got something out of my, uh, my rambling here and uh, I'll be back with you with more videos later this week. Really hope you enjoyed and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.